Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We are pleased to welcome David Eisenhower who is going to talk to us a little bit about um, General Eisenhower's military service and how he, how it developed him into a leader and um, eventually um, led to him being president. Um, I always allow our, um, our panelists, or our speakers to introduce themselves and tell us what they want us to know about them. So I will turn this over to you, David, and take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Samantha, Don, uh, Meredith, I hope you're there. Uh, Mac Teasley, if he's around. Mary Jean, I think she's uh, subscribed, my sister. Uh, Mary, uh, good to uh, talk with you. Uh, I'm used to looking into a screen uh, on Zoom, but, we, but I'm talking to you in my classroom. Uh, we just had a three-hour class uh, on uh, a presidential speech that broke up uh, several minutes ago, and uh, thank you for accommodating me. Uh, there was a several minute overlap uh, in this program and that uh, event, but we were able to resolve it. Uh, I'm very, uh, mm, uh, okay, myself, uh, I am a grandson of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. I have spent a fair amount of time in Abilene. Mary is living there now uh, for good reason. Uh, this is a town that uh, Probably more than any other place in America reminds me of the town where I actually grew up, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's no accident. Uh, Gettysburg is on Route 30, which turns into Route 70, which runs about a mile and a half north of uh, where you all are. Uh, and uh, the Eisenhowers uh, uh, really shuttled between the two. Uh, they lived in Gettysburg when I was growing up because of its proximity to New York and to Washington. Uh, but they decided to situate their library in Abilene. Uh, which is uh, my grandfather's uh, true home. And, uh, and so I've spent a fair amount of time uh, in Abilene over the years. I researched two books there that I've written uh, about Dwight Eisenhower. One is Eisenhower at War, published by Random House in 1986. Uh, the second is uh, Going Home to Glory, published in uh, 2011 by Simon & Schuster. These are uh, books that uh, bookend uh, the Eisenhower presidency. I'll explain why I, uh, how, that, how those books uh, came about. Uh, I went to Amherst. I'm a, uh, I'm a graduate of George Washington Law School. I spent uh, a number of years in the Navy. Uh, but uh, over the last 35 years or so, I have been a uh, fellow. I'm not a PhD, so technically I'm a fellow, though I am tenured at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And here I have taught uh, political science, international relations, uh, communications, uh, political communications, which was our class tonight. Uh, and I run a program here called the Institute for Public Service, uh, which is, uh, uh, we provide a kind of alternative to Wharton, which you've probably heard of, <clears throat> uh, the great business school attached to University of Pennsylvania. We have public service-minded people uh, who come through this school, and it's our job to try to snag and inspire them. And in fact, one of the things that we do uh, is we have a unique feature in uh, our program. We send, uh, with travel stipends, we send students, everybody uh, who are in our classes, to the Library of Congress, National Archives and Records Administration, library, uh, presidential libraries around the country to do primary research on speeches. And I've had a policy over the years of not sending people to the Eisenhower Library because uh, uh, I would be prejudiced in the sense that I would be an impossible editor uh, on any Eisenhower project. Uh, and uh, uh, I also don't want students to think they're pleasing me or displeasing me by choice of a choice of a topic, so I've taken it off the table. I've made a couple exceptions, and every exception uh, I have made uh, has uh, uh, been a university or a school-wide prize winner. Uh, so the Eisenhower Library, I know, is one of the great facilities in the world. Uh, I would say the only thing uh, that I would say they could sort of match each other are FDR and uh, the Eisenhower Library leadership in war and in peace, both of them. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Abilene is the best possible place to do research on the presidency, and uh, I'm glad our foundation is active there, and I'm looking forward to working with them in the future. Our topic tonight is at ease. Uh, for the at ease is uh, the military Eisenhower. Uh, that is the making uh, of an officer, how he came to be an officer, and there's a lot of speculation uh, on this topic uh, necessarily uh, because not a lot is known about uh, Dwight Eisenhower's uh, early years. 
looking at the subject in the abstract, uh, how he became a military officer is really uh, a question of nature or nurture. Uh, was this some, a role that he was educated into? Is this a role that he was born into? I think Mary will back me up on this. Uh, when we lived in Gettysburg, I would say that uh, with my father present, my grandfather in the battlefield nearby, I grew up uh, sort of attending a seamless seminar uh, on military history. I would have called my grandfather a natural. This was a dinner time conversation around uh, our table at the Eisenhower Farm and uh, at our house that adjoined the farm. Uh, the Gettysburg National Park is a very special place. That is certainly uh, why uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, went there uh, uh, to, a, uh, in a sense, he, was in, he had served uh, in Gettysburg earlier in his military career. But I think just the inspirational setting, I would say the association uh, between Gettysburg in the 19th century and Dwight Eisenhower's great, uh, uh, um, I would say, test, uh, the Normandy battle of the 20th century are in a sense uh, parallel events. Gettysburg is the 19th century Normandy. Normandy is the 20th century Gettysburg in many ways. And I think um, at some level uh, associating the two uh, drew uh, Dwight Eisenhower to this convenient place, Gettysburg located between uh, New York and Washington. At any rate, civil war was nightly fair in our home. Interestingly, that was a kind of substitute for talking about uh, World War II. Uh, World War II was not uh, encouraged uh, in our house. I was not discouraged from learning about World War II. But one of the reasons that I took up Eisenhower at war uh, was to fill in gaps. I was conscious that uh, the war, Second World War, the European theater was something that my grandfather and father had in common that I was not part of. And uh, that this was a subject that uh, they declined to discuss casually, uh, but they, uh, discussed with enthusiasm uh, the American Civil War. Uh, this was also the era, late 50s, early 60s, where we're approaching centennials uh, of the various uh, events of the American Civil War. And so uh, publishers were turning out book after book after book. So there's always something to discuss uh, every week. Uh, in the course of this, I get the sense of both my father and my grandfather uh, as military people. Uh, indirectly, and Mary will back me up on this as well. Uh, we had no doubt about the importance of the war, though my grandfather did not speak of it uh, a great deal. We had no doubt about the importance of it uh, to his life. We were surrounded by war figures. There's a kind of family story that we all tell, uh, that uh, we all love. Uh, the year was 1954. That's 10 years after the Normandy landings. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower is president. His brother Milton is president of Penn State. Milton invites Dwight to deliver the commencement at Penn State. And this was a big event. And uh, this story is retold many times. Uh, <clears throat> Penn State is a huge university, as you know. And so what, what occurs there is a major logistical undertaking. And as it turned out, June 1954, the outdoor event at Penn State was threatened by, by rain and weather. And so there is this scene which people have described of my uncle Milton uh, walking around the president's office, sort of wringing his hands. Uh, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Uh, Dwight was standing off on the side. He was smiling, he says, Milton, since June 6, 1944, I've never worried about the rain. And I think that's probably a pretty accurate uh, description of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, what the war meant to him, never having to worry about the rain. We've gone through a series of anniversaries on D-Day, by the way. Uh, 2019 was the 75th anniversary. One of my favorite bloggers, uh, well, the uh, 70th anniversary really began a trend in 2014. Uh, when at the Normandy battlefield, either a head of state or a head of government from every belligerent in the European theater uh, decided to turn up for the D-Day 70th anniversary uh, commemorations. Uh, this is beyond significant. Uh, we have Putin, uh, Russians, we had the uh, <clears throat> Ukrainian president, uh, the, the, the Belarusians were there, uh, the Germans were there for the, for the first time. Uh, every belligerent decided that Normandy uh, was the point at which they would uh, commemorate uh, the victory in World War II together. This could have been Moscow, it could have been 
uh, Volgograd, it could have been Leningrad, it could have been a lot of places on the Eastern Front, but no, all the parties came together to identify that site uh, as the pivotal moment in World War II. As a blogger, one of my favorites uh, on the 75th anniversary put it, on June 6th, 1944, 75 years ago, the Nazi war machine was attacked from the sea on the beaches of Normandy. D-Day was and is the single greatest event for good ever wrought by man. This was a critical moment, and this is uh, central to the legacy of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. The question is, um, how did he arrive there? Uh, what, what kinds of things could have trained him or his contemporaries uh, for this supreme moment uh, in American history uh, and all that followed it uh, in the wake of this? To say that uh, I grew up on a Civil War battlefield and listened to Civil War history uh, is uh, one thing that we spent Sundays uh, going to uh, various Civil War battlefields. Uh, I'm a great believer in visiting battlefields and so forth. Uh, my grandparents did expose us uh, to Normandy in a fairly spectacular way. I don't mean to say that they didn't. Uh, remember 1962, I was 14 years old. Mary, was, uh, Mary stayed behind on this one. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> my grandparents decided to take my sister Anne and myself to Europe. Uh, on a 38-day trip uh, they, that they took. As it turns out, by the way, uh, thanks to records that I have been sent from the Kennedy Library, uh, to an extent, Dwight Eisenhower was actually a, uh, on a diplomatic mission for the president, uh, President Kennedy, that summer, just before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but uh, the point of this was to tour, I think, for the last time, uh, these areas that have been so faithful for the West and so faithful for Dwight Eisenhower and his life. And so I can remember we uh, took a, uh, <clears throat> we took a passenger ship, uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth II to Cherbourg. Uh, we uh, disembarked at uh, Cherbourg, which was a critical allied point, uh, port from September, 1944 onwards. I remember we boarded a train uh, and I think this was our, our grandparents' way of introducing me and Anne to the, to the war. We boarded a train in Cherbourg, made our way down the invasion front, which is very long, uh, 70 or 80 miles, and uh, stopped at every town. And we can remember, uh, Anne and I both remember the throngs that uh, turned out in Cherbourg uh, and elsewhere, uh, San Lo, Saint Laurent, uh, Aromanche, Bayou, Caen, Bissieu, uh, so forth, uh, these uh, uh, people who had living memories uh, of this war, which had uh, just ended uh, 17 years before, if you can imagine. We continued on from there uh, to get a sense of Europe in the post-war period. Uh, we went to Paris several times. Uh, we dined with de Gaulle. Uh, we went to Bonn, uh, which was the point very close to where Allied forces actually entered Germany uh, in March of 1945 near the Remagen Bridge. Uh, we took a cruise up and down the Rhine, uh, went to Bonn for meetings with Adenauer, who's the great uh, German post-war figure, uh, onto Denmark, uh, which was liberated by British forces in May of 1945, to Sweden as a sort of uh, side trip uh, back uh, to Denmark, back to Paris, back to England, where we toured war damage. Uh, my grandfather was actually uh, able to call on Churchill, who was still alive uh, on that trip. Uh, we met uh, many of his wartime colleagues onto Scotland, uh, and Colleen Castle, uh, which was uh, close to Presswick Air, Air Base, where uh, uh, Eisenhower was a military commander flying from Washington uh, back to England on several transatlantic flights. It would have probably landed in uh, Prestwick, at least the uh, place had a great sentimental significance for him, and on to Dublin and home. This was uh, a time in which we uh, observed the uh, sadness of post-war Europe, the tumult of post-war Europe, the hopefulness of it, and also the significance of this uh, in the European mind. The crowds were beyond belief. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people turning out in Bonn, Cologne, uh, Paris, London, and so forth. A brilliant era uh, brought home to us by a trip, not by a lecture, not by discussions over dinner, but by a trip. Uh, I was raised, in fact, uh, Mary probably the same as a sort of in a non-political environment. Knowing my grandfather, 
as a neighbor for a number of years. Uh, I actually roomed with him uh, on several trips, including the 62 European trip. Uh, I, my legal residence was in Gettysburg until 1979, some years after he died. Uh, we grew up knowing them principally as grandparents. We were aware of the war heritage, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I knew my grandfather as a painter, a golfer, a bridge player, a, sh a skeet shooter. I knew him as a president. I can have very vivid pictures of him as uh, president of the United States. I knew him as a farm manager and boss. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the first to give me my uh, job uh, for 25 cents an hour working as a farmhand in Gettysburg. He was also the first to fire me in the summer of 1963. Uh, that was uh, five years into my uh, duty on the farm. I overstayed a lunch hour, fired, but rehired uh, that afternoon on a golf course, uh, which was uh, happy in the way it went. Uh, grant, my granddad had a saying, he allowed all of his associates one mistake a year. I had mine. Uh, and so I was rehired. But uh, by and large, this was a uh, an, uh, a, an idyllic uh, period in my life. Uh, Gettysburg was uh, a special place because of the battle, but uh, uh, the presidency was over. Uh, this was uh, politics seemed uh, far away, at least for a while. In fact, when I went off to Phillips Exeter Academy, I became the target of one of the uh, uh, most famous practical jokes in Phillips Exeter history, and that was my election by acclamation, nomination and election by acclamation to the only partisan uh, position I've ever been elected to or held in my life, and that was Secretary Treasurer Young Democrats, Phillips Exeter. That was supposed to be a sort of a welcoming gesture. It was supposed to be a practical joke. Uh, it was received that way. In fact, it became a news item. Uh, there was a little story on it that appeared in the New York Times. Uh, my parents found out about it. They thought it was funny. I wanted to think it was funny. Granddad finds out about it. He didn't think it was funny at all. Uh, so the man I'd known for years as Granddad, I came to see as General Eisenhower uh, in, those, uh, uh, in those moments. Uh, he was uh, somebody who had a very formidable persona uh, when he decided to exhibit it. I would have remained that way. Uh, on, uh, perhaps indefinitely, I went to Amherst College in the fall of 1966, it turns out that uh, my current wife, Julie Nixon, was also enrolling at Smith that same fall. I got to know her uh, very quickly. Uh, we were engaged very rapidly. Uh, we became an item. Almost didn't happen, by the way. Uh, if you can imagine the awkwardness I felt uh, presenting myself at her dorm in the early days. Uh, this one night in particular, I presented myself to this proctor, a senior student on duty. I'm David Eisenhower, and I would like to see Julie Nixon. And she looks over her horn room glasses and says, well, my name is Harry Truman. Uh, and, uh, but I persisted. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so we got together and I experienced this great adventure of 1968. Uh, an election that really moved the United States beyond uh, the post-D-Day uh, era. 1968 was a, an election year dominated by the Vietnam War. Uh, the candidate that I was with uh, throughout was Richard Nixon, who was campaigning on a riddle. Uh, that was a promise to end the war in Vietnam and in, uh, end the war in Vietnam and win the peace, uh, suggesting that uh, the natural connection between victory in war and victory in peace were being rearranged as the United States moves into a sort of post-Cold War uh, era, which uh, begins uh, at some indefinable point in the Nixon presidency. One of the things that I learned throughout that campaign was, I think, a lesson about leadership, presidential leadership, but it's also something that I've applied uh, in studying and writing about my grandfather, uh, and that is the uh, fact that the presidency uh, as an executive, but an elective position, is in the final analysis a mission-oriented job. Uh, the mission that the 1968 campaign sets forth for everyone involved was coming to grips uh, with the Vietnam problem. This is dominant. Uh, the presidency as a mission-oriented job explains most things about the Nixon presidency, the dynamics of its rise, even the dynamics of uh, the Watergate and resignation in many ways. Uh, but, the, but the thing that uh, that made things work, and a lot of things did work in that period, was the ability of people <clears throat> to re relate particulars to the general, uh, and that is to concentrate on the main 
task at hand, which was to extract the United States from uh, a losing effort in Vietnam and doing so in a way uh, that would ultimately uh, win the peace. As Dwight Eisenhower put it, and I think that this is something that he would have uh, endorsed as well, we succeed only insofar as we identify in life uh, uh, or in war or anything else, a single overriding objective and base all other considerations upon it. In experiencing the 1968 campaign, uh, I did not realize it at the time, but I was really rehearsing uh, Eisenhower at War, the book that I did on uh, Dwight Eisenhower and the, and the European Theater of Operations. The singleness of purpose uh, is what stands out uh, in the record of Dwight Eisenhower as a commander uh, in that conflict. And so that aspect of leadership, the mission-oriented notion of leadership, uh, is something that uh, he came by how? Was this nature or nurture? This is a question that um, I considered gradually over time. I've never written anything formally on my grandfather's uh, early life, though I have written about it, uh, and I may publish it uh, someday. But uh, my original intent in going into the writing field uh, was to <clears throat> become a writer, that is, uh, to perhaps become a journalist, I had in the back of my mind that I would want to do this in a university setting, but I really wanted to become a writer. And so one of the things you do as a writer is write what you know about. I was also uh, in the late 70s. I was at a point in my life where I think I was uh, nostalgic. Uh, I wanted to revisit this time in Gettysburg. Uh, so I entered a contract with Random House to do a uh, book on Dwight Eisenhower. Actually, the book that I published second. Uh, this would have been a profile of him, probably late presidency, early retirement years, uh, the Ike that I knew. And uh, I came up with a manuscript uh, <clears throat> on that pretty quickly. The problem was I could not start it. Uh, <clears throat> Random House was uh, my editor, Jason Epstein, who just passed away. He was very enthusiastic about what he had, but we had to start it. So if you're going to base a vivid portrait on Dwight Eisenhower as a gentleman farmer in Gettysburg, this is a story that takes on great poignance uh, in the context of his dashed hopes in 1960 to resolve the Cold War, the narrow loss uh, of the election in 1960, Nixon versus Kennedy, but above all, the resumption of a Cold War in 1960, which, uh, <clears throat> which uh, greatly disappointed Dwight Eisenhower, who became president, I'm convinced, with the idea of, uh, <clears throat> of bringing about the kind of reconstruction that post-war American presidents uh, brought about after the U.S. Civil War. So I tried to start in 1960, but I found that the U-2 affair in 1960 and the Berlin crisis uh, really required me to go back to uh, uh, 1958, the Lebanese intervention, uh, the uh, brinksmanship over that between the U.S. and Soviets, uh, which tracks back to the 1957 crisis over Syria, uh, the Sputnik events of 1957, I could not tell that story uh, without going back to the 1956 election, uh, the Suez affair in Hungary, uh, which, uh, which is a great uh, uh, melodrama, uh, clashes across the board, clashes in the Middle East, clashes in Eastern Europe, uh, one of the high points of the Cold War. I could not tell that story without going back to the Geneva Conference of 55, which required me uh, to look at the Indochina War, uh, which required me to look at Korea, uh, which required me to look at uh, McCarthyism, which required me to look at the 1952 election, and you get the idea. I keep falling back. Uh, eventually, I find myself sort of committed to a much longer project than I anticipated. So uh, <clears throat> at one point, I did the logical thing, I think, and that is I uh, tried to approach it from the other side. That is, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was born on October 14th, 1890 in Texas. Uh, moves to Abilene, moves back to Abilene, his family moves back to Abilene, and so on and so on. Uh, that would have, uh, that raises the question of nature, not necessarily nurture. Uh, what was he born? What kind of person was he uh, early in life? Uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, well, there is also the question of context. Uh, this is uh, Abilene, as we know, in 1890, was very close to the uh, Western frontier. I think while Bill Hickok had been marshaled there, uh, this is something that Dwight Eisenhower, as a young boy there, would have been viewed. This is part of his character. Uh, being part of Kansas uh, in the late 19th century, I think, uh, was uh, probably very special as being an American anywhere. Uh, a, a historical individual that Dwight Eisenhower is compared with is Ulysses Grant. 
And uh, while I did not, I do not recall my grandfather offering a lot of opinions about Grant. In fact, he offered many opinions in defense of his uh, lieutenants. Uh, he is somebody whose career parallels Grant's in many ways. Ulysses Grant's presidency begins as close to Dwight Eisenhower's uh, birth as George W. Bush's presidency is to us today. So he's essentially born in a post-Grant, post-Civil War environment. Grant, by the way, is a very interesting speaker. Uh, he's a very interesting president, very underrated president, in my opinion. Uh, one of the things teaching presidential speech here I've noticed are the grand inaugurals, which kind of capture the spirit that Dwight Eisenhower is born into. In his first inaugural in 1869, Grant says, the young men of this country, uh, those who from their age must be its rulers 25 years hence, have a peculiar interest in maintaining the national honor. A moment's reflection as to what will be our commanding influence among the nations of the earth in their day. Uh, if they are only true to themselves, should inspire them with national pride. Four years later, at his second inaugural, he speaks thusly and as a kind of seer, a sort of forecasting Dwight Eisenhower's career. In the future, while I hold my present office, the subject of acquiring territory must have the support of the people before I will <clears throat> be uh, <clears throat> moved into any position looking towards uh, acquisition of new land. Uh, but I must say that I do not share in the apprehensions held by many as to the dangers of our government becoming weakened by reason of the extension of American territory. Uh, <clears throat> commerce, education, and the rapid transmission of thought and material by telegraph and steam have changed all of this. Uh, in fact, I do believe that our great maker is preparing the world in his own good time to become one nation speaking one language when armies and navies will no longer be required. So you have these kinds of themes uh, in America in the Abilene when Dwight Eisenhower uh, is a young boy. Uh, America is a kind of city on a hill. We're preparing ourselves for great responsibility. America is a light unto all nations, but we are leading uh, others towards a world without uh, nation states, uh, a kind of international and a global civilization. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower will embody, it seems to me, that apparent paradox, which Grant says is not a paradox. He's from the geodetic center of the United States, literally. And yet his greatest fame uh, will be achieved uh, serving uh, in positions overseas about as far from Abilene as one can get. Uh, so he is an American citizen. He's also a uh, citizen of the world. Uh, and this is a very important theme in his life. Well, who was he? I would have started back then. I encountered all kinds of ambiguities. I think Mac would uh, back me up on this and anybody at the library. There's very, there's scant documentation of his boyhood. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that covered a lot of sins. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was able to register at West Point uh, in June of 1911, listing Denison or Tyler, Texas as his birthplace rather than Denison. Apparently it's better to be from Tyler. Uh, he called himself Dwight David Eisenhower rather than David Dwight Eisenhower, which is how he's baptized because nobody's the wiser. He switches first and second name. Uh, nobody could call him on that. There's no explanation for why he did that particularly. Uh, he neglected to tell West Point that he had actually played professional baseball in the Kansas State League in 1909-1910, which would have cost him his amateur status. Uh, I revealed that in my book, Going Home to Glory. Uh, and... Uh, an episode where Red Patterson asked General Eisenhower at a 1947 Giants game, uh, Red Patterson was then director of public relations for the New York Giants. He says, uh, General, uh, 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 organized baseball is uh, hot with all kinds of rumors that you actually played pro ball at one time. Uh, and the story is you played under the alias of Wilson in the Kansas State League, 1909-1910. Uh, Our records show there were two Wilsons in that league. Which one was you? Which one was you? And uh, Dwight Eisenhower said the one that could hit. Uh, that's the story told to me. Go online sometime. Look at Kansas State uh, League, and you will see that there were two Wilsons uh, in that league, 1909-1910. One was a pitcher, and another was a first baseman for a uh, for a ball club called Abilene. Here he is. Nobody knew the difference. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, apparently as a young man, studied military history. He was imbued by uh, the stories of uh, 
General Washington, General Lee, uh, uh, General Grant, I, I assume. Uh, Alexander the Great, Hannibal uh, was somebody that he particularly admired. So he said, uh, whether Dwight Eisenhower was a reader or not, we don't know. Uh, he went to West Point. We know that he was an outstanding athlete, and he always associated athleticism or participation in athletics with uh, leadership training. Uh, the class of 1915, the, star, uh, the class the stars fell upon, uh, was loaded uh, with football players. Bradley was a teammate. Uh, of course, Dwight Eisenhower gets injured. You probably know this story. He played the game of the century against Carlisle and Jim Thorpe, but uh, shortly afterwards in the Tufts game, of I believe his uh, second year, uh, he injured his knee and that knee uh, injury permanently took him out of football. Uh, as the story goes, he became sort of negative at West Point. I'm just back from a trip to West Point uh, and uh, <clears throat> had lunch with uh, several instructors there and we were uh, talking about West Point lore. There's not a lot, uh, the PA Hodgson diary is on file at the Eisner Library. I'd recommend getting it out. This is. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower's roommate he kept a diary the whole time uh, Eisenhower was a cadet, or at least for a year or two of it. And uh, so you can get sort of a picture uh, of this fellow, but it's uh, somewhat indistinct. There are rumors. Uh, we do know that he uh, accumulated a lot of demerits. He graduated about 68th in a class of about 165 or so. Uh, so you would say that he was not particularly academically uh, distinguished. However, uh, according to one fitness report written of him as he graduates from West Point, uh, it is written of him, this cadet is born to command. Nature nurtured uh, by nature. Uh, he impressed uh, West Point, though he was not uh, their top student, uh, as somebody who had great aptitude for command uh, in the various personality traits, intellectual traits, and so forth that that commands. Uh, his next stop out of uh, uh, West Point was to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. This is where he meets Mamie. Uh, they go on to a particularly, I would say, important stop, uh, which is Gettysburg, uh, with the outbreak of World War I. Uh, two and a half years out of West Point, or three, uh, two, two and a half, uh, Eisenhower is promoted practically to rank of colonel. Uh, this is a wartime uh, promotion. This is uh, extremely rapid. He was in charge of training the tank corps uh, at Gettysburg, uh, Camp Colt. Uh, I don't know how many times when I was driving my granddad downtown to Ray and Derek uh, drugstore and so forth, we drove right past the Evergreen, which uh, marks the spot of uh, the Camp Colt uh, headquarters right on the Emmitsburg Road. So he spent uh, a number of months in Camp Colt training uh, American soldiers, tankers who were going to ride uh, French Renault tanks, I believe, in the World War One. We were using French equipment, but he trained them and was uh, organizing a unit that he was going to lead in the uh, European uh, campaign. And uh, this was a, a, a billet of extraordinary uh, responsibility. Uh, there are some uh, snapshots of him as a young commander. Uh, and I would have recognized uh, this individual because I worked for him on the farm. He was a real stickler for detail. He was a very uh, strict disciplinarian. He was all those things. Uh, one of the things that I remember of my grandfather as my boss in Gettysburg is uh, how well he was, uh, how well informed he was of what I was doing. Uh, I always felt that uh, if he had time, he could take my job. Uh, and I think that that's something that uh, is a trait of his. He had a great uh, sense of the tangible. Uh, and he was a very hard worker, and he was determined to learn everything uh, he could about the uh, things that he was responsible for. Uh, that's a, there's a leadership lesson in there. And I think the leadership lesson is uh, leaders uh, uh, don't ask others to do that which they are unwilling or unable to do themselves. And that's uh, what I took away from it. At any rate, uh, he uh, was a major success. He was preparing for distinguished service in World War I. And the armistice is signed. They're actually in New York, I believe, uh, loading equipment. Uh, the armistice comes down. He's going to miss service in World War I. Like many, uh, Bradley and others uh, who would go on to command responsibilities in World War II, finding himself in this situation on November 18th, I think, caused him to reconsider his career, but not very seriously. 
Uh, and this is where I think, again, nature uh, takes, uh, takes hold here. I think that uh, uh, Dwight Eisner reached a, uh, a correct intellectual conclusion, but I think also an emotional one. He was an Army man, uh, saw himself as an Army man, so he's not going to be deterred by this happenstance. Second, uh, in common with uh, uh, many of the stars of his era, uh, those who served in World War I, people that he would serve with in the interwar army, uh, there was the hard calculation that World War I had not resolved the European question. I'm reading a book currently, it is on my bedside table, uh, called 11, 11, 11. This is November 11 uh, at 11 o'clock uh, in the morning on 1918. This is the last day of the European war by Joseph Persico. It's a very uh, uh, interesting a well done a history of the final day of World War I, uh, which featured uh, attacks all up and down the line well after uh, the moment that the Allied commanders knew that an armistice had been signed. Why are they pressing the battle to the very end? Because Pershing and others uh, understood uh, in World War I that Germany had not been defeated in the sense that it had not been occupied, it uh, had not experienced defeat uh, in a way that would table this issue perhaps. I think that soldiers, uh, Marshall, uh, Fox Connor, who would uh, go on and mentor Eisenhower later uh, in, the Panama, in Panama, came away uh, from World War I with a sense of uh, incompleteness. And so if you're a professional uh, in 1918 and 1919, you're thinking uh, that uh, right away we're getting ready. This is, a, this is an armed truce, or this is, a, <clears throat> this is an armistice, but it is a truce uh, and that this uh, issue will recur. Uh, that America would return to Europe is implicit by uh, a sort of superficial reading of World War I. Now, my father and I went to World War I battlefields in 1999. We walked the same fields in 1999. My father was then 77 years old. Uh, that uh, his own father had walked with him uh, in 1929. So 70 years later, dad and I took the same trip that uh, he and his father had taken years before. At the time, my dad was writing a book, which I recommend to everybody uh, who's with us tonight, Yanks, which is about World War I. I uh, got a specially inscribed copy from him because, uh, you know, acknowledging that I made a contribution to that book, I took a lot of notes and I sent him an extensive uh, memorandum on what we'd seen. But we had a kind of epiphany on that trip, which um, must have impressed Americans who served in that theater at some point, that is Americans were there to stay. There is this happenstance and that is America intervenes in uh, the spring of 1918 and suddenly the war ends. Germany has actually defeated and subdued Russia. Uh, they have occupied all of Ukraine. Uh, they've occupied uh, practically Minsk. Uh, they have uh, ended uh, the Eastern front. They are fighting the allies on the Western front. This is supposedly an answer to all their strategic uh, problems. And yet America intervenes uh, with under 2 million troops. Uh, there are two or three major battles, including uh, the San Miguel Salient, which Dad and I toured, and the uh, uh, Moors Argonne Front, which is nearby. These straddle Verdun, and the Germans quit. Why? We had an epiphany one afternoon. Uh, we were uh, at a place uh, close to the, uh, uh, this is in the San Miguel Salient, uh, close to where uh, Allied for or the American Army uh, mounted a major offensive in September of 1918, and we were overlooking a town which is supposedly the scene of our great setback in World War II, uh, World War One, uh, the town of Sitchipuri. This was a town where American forces are being integrated with uh, French and British forces initially when we arrived in the theater. Uh, American forces are introduced in March of 1918. Uh, as they assume positions, they launch attacks into the German line. Uh, the Germans respond with an extraordinary fury. Uh, they drive Americans back four miles. Uh, this becomes like the Catherine Pass in World War II, uh, a defeat that is studied and restudied and restudied and restudied uh, and by uh, the Army War College uh, and other institutions. What went wrong for the American forces there? What lessons can we learn from the battle? We stood out looking at this uh, town and this battlefield, and uh, I think it occurred to us that uh, 
all of the Army studies were really asking the wrong question. The, the, the question was not what, what went wrong with American forces. The question was, why did the Germans respond to that kind of theory? And as we look out over the battlefield, uh, we have a guidebook in hand, and uh, apparently this is a quiet sector in March of 1918. Uh, from 9 to 10, the French shelled the Germans. Apparently from 10 to 11, the Germans would shell the French. From 11 to 12, the French would shell the Germans. From 12 to 1, the Germans would shell the French. Everybody would break for lunch. The shelling would resume about two or three in the afternoon. Uh, knock off around six. Everybody would file their reports. Everybody knew when the shelling was coming. Nobody got hurt. Everybody was happy. War over. What do the Americans do? Uh, the minute they arrive, they go into battle. They didn't know the rules. They didn't know their limitations. Think of how the Germans responded when they see Americans uh, launching all out attacks on positions throughout the Mers Arg Argonne front, which have been considered uh, uh, unassailable for three years. Uh, these are uh, impregnable lines. So these various lines uh, going all the way to the town of Sedan. What to make of these Americans, they simply don't know the rules. They don't know their limitations. Americans did not know their limitations uh, in this period. In fact, it was entirely foreseeable in that period that Americans, some years hence, would travel 4,000 miles from the United States to enter battle against the Germans, a feat that uh, no other nation in the world was capable of simultaneously taking on Japan and Germany, uh, the uh, preeminent military forces in their respective spheres. We would do so simultaneously, that we would simultaneously uh, uh, reach these destinations through sub-infested waters. We would assault barriers that were considered uh, impossible, such as the Normandy coastline. We would achieve the manufacturing miracles that we did. We would produce 150 aircraft carriers, uh, 300,000 combat aircraft, uh, that we would equip the Red Army, that we would do all of these things, that America was capable uh, of such extraordinary feats. I think at some level, uh, Dwight Eisenhower and his contemporaries in the 1920s understood this. Uh, when Eisenhower went to the uh, War College, uh, or the uh, War College where he fit, finished first, uh, he begins to make a series of associations that will last uh, throughout his army period. They're studying problems, uh, all of which uh, had to do with the European theater. By the way, he's networking uh, in this period. My grandfather worked for uh, uh, George Patton. Uh, immediately uh, after World War II, Patton was a hero. When my dad and I were touring the Mers Argonne, we took a pilgrimage to the spot uh, where George Patton had by, uh, as the legend goes, led a cavalry charge, that is he mounted a, a tank chassis and drew a saber and uh, led a tank charge, e.g. a cavalry charge into a fixed German position, which is a period of, um, a story of great lore. Uh, we saw the sites where Douglas MacArthur's Rainbow Division uh, mopped up German resistance uh, around November 11th. Uh, MacArthur wins the uh, Medal of Honor uh, for his service in World War I. Uh, and uh, I, uh, Dwight Eisenhower would go on to work for Douglas MacArthur. He had another fateful, uh, I would say, educational uh, billet uh, when he was in the Army, and that was uh, being assigned to Paris, where my father went to grade school, or preschool and grade school, uh, to work. Uh, for uh, John J. Pershing, uh, who had commanded American forces in World War I. At the time, uh, Pershing became head of the American Battle Monuments uh, Commission. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was his assistant, identifying, uh, organizing, I suppose they were still uh, creating uh, memorial sites in Europe. Uh, among his other duties was to put together a guidebook for American tourists who wanted to visit World War I battlefields this was a project that uh, took them to, took my father and grandfather on the trip that we went on in 1999. It caused Dwight Eisenhower to perform a reconnaissance of all the battlefields over which uh, American armies would pass uh, in World War II. My grandmother considered that to be very, very fateful uh, and so forth. So maybe there's an element of fate in this as well. But he's also uh, at this point beginning to, one, understand command. Uh, under the tutelage of Fox Connor, who had been chief of operations under uh, uh, Pershing. Uh, he served Pershing, so he understood how commanders thought. Uh, he went on to serve Douglas MacArthur. Uh, so he uh, uh, studies 
uh, under Douglas MacArthur, uh, the art of command. Uh, and so forth. And so his education begins. Uh, I would say that uh, American officers in this period form a kind of sect uh, because in the wider world, the idea that America would return to Europe uh, seemed far-fetched. I had dinner years ago with Claire Booth Luce. This is in the mid 80s. And my book was about to come out. We were talking about the subject of World War II. And she says, you know, I, I read my entire uh, young adulthood or whatever, I thought it would be impossible for America ever to return to Europe and to fight another war there. Among other things, if a war would never happen, uh, the people would never allow governments to get involved in a war again. Uh, and uh, so this would never happen. Uh, <clears throat> so the never again, Americans spent many years uh, uh, investigating uh, setbacks, including November 11th, 1918, uh, why so many people died that day. Never again. There was a feeling that Europe was a fire trap. Uh, we adhered to the Kellogg Briand Pact in 1928, outlawing wars and instrument of national policy, as did the Germans. It was impossible to think after the Great War that uh, Germany would uh, be allowed or find a way to reopen all of the issues that we thought that we had resolved at Versailles. It was impossible uh, to think that. Uh, uh, this conflict uh, could not be averted. But Eisenhower and this small coterie of military officers, those born to command, uh, those now being educated, felt they knew better. And I think they were preparing for uh, a war throughout the uh, interwar period. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower has written about his mentorship uh, or being mentored by Fox Connor, working with George Patton. Uh, my uh, little... Uh, <clears throat> This comes up uh, a fair amount, and that is uh, Dwight Eisenhower's personal heroes. As somebody who's been immersed in the subject uh, over, the, over the years and so forth, I've concluded that Eisenhower really had uh, several personal heroes. Uh, one was MacArthur and the other was Patton. These were people senior to him in the Army uh, and so forth, but they were uh, <clears throat> people that, uh, as fate would have it, he would wind up uh, commanding himself. Uh, at any rate, he served under these people. He was uh, separated from MacArthur, uh, he had misunderstandings with many of them. Uh, MacArthur was critical of Eisenhower's uh, command, uh, or I would say his uh, critical of Eisenhower later uh, as a public pers personality. He looked back on uh, Eisenhower's 10-year service and said, Eisenhower was the best clerk I ever had. Uh, Eisenhower looked back on MacArthur and said, the finest instructor of dramatics that I ever studied under and so forth. So they were, they were unkind in the future. But the fact is, he was learning command. Then uh, the final line of resistance, uh, the idea that the allied forces uh, in the West would deter uh, a rearmed Germany from launching general war uh, fails. The French front fails. Uh, and we find ourselves in war. Uh, as Churchill put it on September 3, 1939, this is not a question of fighting for Danzig or fighting for Poland. We are fighting to save the whole world from the pestilence of Nazi tyranny and in defense of all that is most sacred to man. This is no war of domination or imperial aggrandizement or material gain, no war to shut any country out of its sunlight. It is a war viewed in its inherent quality to establish on impregnable rocks the rights of the individual and to establish and revive the stature of man. This was a great cause, which Eisenhower saw very clearly. He saw it coming for many years. So my, grand, uh, my dad uh, told the story that when granddad was in uh, Manila, uh, he asked his father, uh, why don't you leave the army? You've been a major for all these years. Uh, this is the pearl of the Orient. There are business opportunities all around you. Dwight Eisenhower just replies, matter of factly, John War's coming in 24 to 36 months. And when it does come, I'm going straight to the top. Uh, when MacArthur separates Dwight Eisenhower in 1939, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and this is uh, attested to in the diaries, which are on file out in Abilene, uh, <clears throat> was upset, felt he'd let the, uh, the general down. But MacArthur, in discharging him, writes a fitness report in which he says, this is the finest officer in the United States Army. Uh, when hostilities break out, uh, he must be moved immediately to general's list, which is what happened. Uh, and in the course of this, uh, he uh, uh, finds himself uh, um, uh, moving to various combat 
commands during the maneuvers and so forth to check boxes so that he would not be ineligible for field command. He turns down faithfully an assignment uh, to join his old friend, G uh, Leonard G. Giroux on the warplan staff, which means that uh, he's not present when uh, Pearl Harbor happens. And so he does not like Giroux did. Uh, Giroux would go on to command uh, uh, five corps at Omaha Beach, but he was greatly compromised by the fact that he was in charge of uh, routing messages on December 7th, 1941. Spent six months testifying before the Ryrie's Commission explaining why that didn't happen. Eisenhower misses that, so he is fortunate. But uh, eventually, uh, he finds himself coming to the attention of Franklin Roosevelt. He impressed Roosevelt with his steely qualities, uh, with his toughness, uh, also with his willingness to uh, sacrifice, I would say, for, for the war effort. Uh, one of the things that my father felt was instrumental in my grandfather's career was uh, the Darlan affair of late 1942, where Dwight Eisenhower took responsibility for working out an armistice with a Vichy official uh, in charge of all of Northern France. Uh, this was supposedly trucking with fascism. This was supposedly a deal that Americans were above. Uh, this uh, supposedly sullied the American cause. Eisenhower's willingness to do this was controversial. It almost cost him his command, but he took responsibility. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt noted that uh, and knew that in Eisenhower, he had somebody that, in fact, he allowed Eisenhower to take credit uh, or responsibility for it. He knew that he had somebody who would make things easy on civilian leadership, which was uh, uh, one of the things that Dwight Eisenhower would prove that he would do throughout uh, the early phases of the European conflict or the North African uh, and Italian conflict. He is somebody who was actually underqualified uh, for the overlord command, uh, whereas Marshall was overqualified. Because he was willing to sacrifice his reputation in the Darlan affair, because he was lucky, uh, because he proved that he had diplomatic skills, uh, and his abilities as a strategist were sort of debatable, but nonetheless, his campaigns worked, uh, he was eligible for command of Overlord. Uh, General Marshall was overqualified. If Marshall had commanded Overlord, let's say, and it had failed, uh, the Americans would have found uh, great difficulty, I think, in reconstituting uh, that effort. So Dwight Eisenhower finds himself uh, moving towards a point in my studies where I think it's safe to say that what happens to Dwight Eisenhower before 1943 is very important in understanding him as a personality, but nothing could have specifically prepared himself in this period, and this goes for his military leadership as well, uh, for the responsibilities that he would assume in the European theater from December 43 through May of 45. Uh, by contrast, what happens to him in that period makes it predictable and inevitable that he become president of the United States. By the same token, I would say the American people, easygoing as they were, uh, between 1900 and 1943, uh, nothing preordains uh, or prepares Americans for the intensive campaigns that they will fight in 1944 and 45. And yet as they emerge from those campaigns, it becomes predictable and inevitable that the United States will assume the preeminence that it did uh, in the Cold War. So who was he? He was a professional soldier, uh, but he was um, uh, extolled in command as a sort of regular guy, as a citizen. So he had those qualities, of middle American qualities and so forth. He's been accused of being a politician. I asked Leonard Hall, who was a former chairman of the Republican National Committee when I was researching uh, Eisenhower many years ago uh, for things that I've published and things that I will publish. Uh, and I, I asked him about this charge by politicians that Ike was a general, charges by generals that Ike was a politician. Uh, what did he, Leonard Hall, chairman of the Republican Party, have to say about Eisenhower as a politician? And he said, the two greatest natural politicians he ever saw in his life were Al the Happy Warrior Smith, Governor of New York, and Dwight Eisenhower. Knew what to do, uh, knew how to do it uh, in every setting, so forth. Had an uh, extraordinary political aptitude. Uh, and he was also a man in a hurry. I was on a, uh, a panel with a man by the name of Paul Fussell years ago who wrote an acclaimed book on his uh, very dark experiences in the Hurtgen Forest. And at one point he turned to me and he says, you got something, and I have to say to my fellow panelists here, and this is a very formidable guy, said uh, you got something very right about uh, Eisenhower in Eisenhower War. And that is uh, 
he was popular in the theater. And one reason he was popular in the theater is that he never wore a helmet. Uh, he was somebody that uh, was in a hurry to get the war over. He was doing a job. Everybody else was doing a job. He was not pretending that he was doing their job. Uh, he was doing his own, and he was focused on getting it done. Clausewitz says, uh, wrote centuries ago, a powerful emotion must stir the ambitions of a great military leader, be it uh, must stir the emotions and the abilities of a great military leader, whether it be ambition in the case of Caesar, whether it be hatred of the enemy in the case of Hannibal, or pride in a glorious defeat, which was characteristic of Frederick the Great. What was Montgomery? Montgomery was somebody with a passion for tidiness, but he is uh, characterized by many people having something in common with Eisenhower, and that was an iron will to prevail. Of Dwight Eisenhower, Max Hastings writes, uh, uh, akin to descriptions of German generals, he was a man of relentless clarity of purpose and an absolute will to win. He was dedicated to the cause, and this was uh, dedicated to the mission. Uh, which was one of his extraordinary traits. As he wrote in September of 1939, his war breaks out in a very prophetic diary entry. His iron determination is apparent. He's in Manila at the time. If the war, he wrote uh, with the news of the declaration of war by Britain and France against Germany, which now seems to be upon us, is as long drawn out and disastrous, as bloody and costly as the so-called Great War. The remnants of nations emerging from it will be scarcely recognizable as the ones who entered it. Uh, it does not seem possible that people who proudly refer to themselves as intelligent would let this situation come about. Hundreds of millions will suffer privations and starvation. Millions will be killed and wounded because one man so wills it, a power drunk, egocentric, criminally insane, and yet, unfortunately, the absolute ruler of 89 million people. And by his personal magnetism, which he must have, he's converted a large portion of those millions to his insane schemes and to blind acceptance of his leadership. Unless he is successful in overcoming the whole world by brute force, the final result will be that Germany will be dismembered and destroyed. He never deviated from that, nor did he ever deviate uh, from his ability to get along with uh, the British uh, in a very profound way. Uh, the great test in World War II was uh, Germany was posed evils, uh, but there is a lot of evil in the world. Uh, the challenge is not so much recognizing evil. The challenge is doing something about it. And I think that this was uh, one, one thing that, uh, this is an approach that Dwight Eisenhower brought to his generalship, the idea that the real task in World War II was to mobilize democracies uh, to fight uh, the totalitarian uh, armies on terms and to prevail over them uh, in a moral test uh, of strength. This was uh, <clears throat> something that uh, is inherent in D-Day strategy. Uh, it was something that uh, permeated uh, his relations with the British because the British faced the very same uh, challenge. Uh, one of my favorite movies out now, and I like it because it's based on a uh, speech as Darkest Hour, based on my favorite speech probably, uh, Winston Churchill, when he brings the new world uh, into the British cause, uh, which is not a matter of survival necessarily. It is not a matter of recognizing evil or even stopping it. It is a matter of mobilizing democracy uh, to do what the circumstances required. As you said, uh, toward the end of the, uh, uh, of the conflict, and I will close with this, uh, <clears throat> these were convictions and orientation towards mission, things that he came by uh, through character, temperament, experience, a fair amount of nurture, but also nature. As he told the British Parliament, I come from the heart of America in the super superficial aspects by which we ordinarily recognize family relationships. The town where I was born and the town where I was reared are far separated from this city. Abilene, Kansas and Denison would together form just one 500th of Great London. By our standards, our towns are young and yours aged. To those people, I am proud to belong. Yet kinship among nations is not determined by measurements such as proximity and age. Rather, we should turn to those inner things, call them what you will, the intangibles that, that are the real treasures free men possess. To preserve his freedom of worship, his equality before the law, his liberty to speak and act as he sees fit, subject only 
that he trespass not on the rights of others. A Londoner will fight, and so will a citizen of Abilene. The most important line, I think, of his entire uh, career as a speaker. Kenneth Davis, in the first book on Dwight Eisenhower, which I regard probably as the best, uh, first impressions are always uh, very lasting, wrote a book entitled Dwight Eisenhower, Soldier of Democracy. I think that's what he was. Uh, he was born a soldier, that's nature. Uh, and he uh, ended uh, as a soldier of democracy that was uh, nurture. He was somebody who uh, was educated in the fine points of military strategy, but he also, in the 30s, typical of citizens uh, throughout the world, uh, concerned citizens, understood the mission uh, that his forces were called upon to achieve. He was able to do so with relentlessness of purpose, uh, which is his claim to more than stewardship, his claim to greatness. Uh, the key to his success in World War II, and I would say his success as presidency, uh, that is uh, setting before himself a task that needs to be done, devoting mind, spot, uh, body, and spirit to doing that. Uh, that makes a soldier, that makes a success in any way of life. And that would be my answer to the question of nature versus nurture. So it's been a real pleasure uh, to at least talk about this uh, for a while at, at ease. And uh, I am, by the way, looking forward to getting out there. And I, I keep telling Don that uh, I'm coming. Uh, I actually have some things that I want to do in the library. Now, we will be sending some uh, uh, students from my seminar out there next year, probably. Uh, but I want to get out there. I want to see uh, how things are going. I'll, I want to see the, the new exhibits uh, and so forth. And I want to. Uh, uh, pay my respects to old friends. And uh, I have a lot of old friends out there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, David. Um, we do have quite a number of questions and comments in the chat. However, right. it is past our time. Um, what I will say is that you are welcome to stay on. We will work through these questions as long as- um, Sure, I've got, I've got some time. If, if you don't mind, I, I've got a food bar here and I might uh, take a bite or two, but- uh, I'm, I'm, I'm game, so. I don't think anyone minds. And also to the audience, we will keep going. Um, but if you can't stay with us, thank you for joining us. But if you can, hang out with us for a little while and we'll try to get through all these questions. Wonderful. Mm. All right, so the first question says, what did your father say about your, your grandfather, Dwight D. Eisenhower, outside of the war years as a father and what was Dwight D. Eisenhower's parental philosophy? Dwight D. Eisenhower's parental philosophy. Um, I would say dad summed it up in the first line of his uh, autobiography, which, which reads as follows. First line, quote, I was born standing at attention, close quote. <clears throat> uh, in other <laughs> words, I think uh, Dwight Eisenhower was uh, probably as rewarding a parent or grandparent as you would ever encounter. I think that his, uh, he was a tough, uh, disciplinarian, he uh, and uh, you respected that. In fact, in many ways, I was sort of awed by it. But I never doubted, and I'm positive that my father was probably in the same position. I never doubted that he cared greatly for us, uh, and that uh, he was teaching us uh, important things. And in hindsight, uh, he was teaching us things that were probably unattainable. How many Dwight Eisenhowers are there in this world? Uh, how many have there ever been? Uh, his story is really, literally, uh, considering uh, Abilene, his background, he's a one in 10 million. Uh, this is a very far-fetched thing, but uh, he did set standards uh, in a way that uh, made it impossible not to be better, want to be better, uh, and impossible not to feel profound fondness for his energy, I think, uh, what he dedicated to, to raising my father. And I got a fair portion of that because we were living on the boundary of the farm. And uh, <clears throat> I think at a certain point, he took me on as sort of a project. Um, he wanted to prevent... Uh, uh, me and other people my age, and my sisters can attest to this as well, from uh, uh, falling for the, uh, uh, the temptations of post-war America where everything is comfortable. Uh, he believed uh, that uh, 
That's one reason why he's on a farm. You don't want to get too far from nature. Uh, you want to be self-sufficient to the degree you can. You want to learn skills that uh, mean survival in this world. That's the foundations of self-confidence. Self-confidence is the foundation of a good life and also a, uh, a good political system and self-rule as well. So my answer to what kind of parent was he? Uh, what did my dad say about my granddad? My, grand, my dad uh, told me very often that he was kind of protecting me from my grandfather. That's one reason why I didn't go to West Point. I was to be given options that my father didn't feel he had. Uh, but I was never deceived uh, in any way that my father was critical of his, of his father. I think that uh, uh, he regarded Dwight Eisenhower, as I did, as the most extraordinary individual I've ever known. Energy, uh, like you've never seen, uh, intelligence, dedication, uh, an impossible example in many ways, but a very inspiring one. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question says, if your grandfather was president when the USSR and the Warsaw Pact dissolved, would your grandfather have withdrawn the U.S. from NATO? I'm sorry, no, I didn't get, uh, if he was president when Warsaw, I didn't get the Warsaw Pact. When the USSR and the Warsaw Pact dissolved, would your grandfather dissolved. have withdrawn? From NATO. Dissolved, yes. The U.S. from NATO, yes. Uh, we've got researchers out there in Abilene uh, who are fresher on this subject than I am. I think that, uh, I don't know what he would have actually done. I think uh, one of the points that Dwight Eisenhower was anxious to make in the late 50s uh, was that uh, we should be open-minded uh, about things when we have the ability to be open-minded. Uh, his farewell address to me uh, contains two pearls of wisdom, two, uh, that are related, uh, that relate to a lot of messaging later in politics. One is the warning against the uh, unwarranted acquisition by a military-industrial complex. The other is the danger that public policy would fall captive to a technological elite. Both of these suggestions are reflected in a lot of speeches by Reagan, by, by, by others, that a problem we have when we organize to do something, to a, accomplish a task, is that we create organizations and these organizations become perpetual. Uh, and they operate independently of the purpose for which they are established and independent of uh, uh, any real controls. Uh, toward the end of his presidency, and I'm certain of this because I've got the documentation in my home, uh, Eisenhower was, uh, uh, President Eisenhower was uh, uh, very skeptical of NATO appropriations. Uh, he was pressing advisors uh, on the NATO question. I don't think that he had even the faintest thought of pulling out of NATO, but I think he wanted to hear that uh, an organization that we entered in order to meet a threat, that is the threat of Soviet aggression in Western Europe, that having met that threat, uh, we are not uh, in a position to reappraise. Uh, that is uh, the ability to reappraise, to reassess, to hold organizations to account. Uh, he regards in his farewell address, and I think philosophically, uh, as, a very, as the critical element in uh, self-government. Would he have dissolved NATO in the wake of Warsaw Pact, uh, Warsaw Pact dissolving? Uh, I don't think so at all. But I think that what he might not have done or would have been very careful about doing, uh, would be pushing NATO east uh, of where it was when um, the Soviet Union dissolved. I think uh, uh, he is a, uh, he would have understood, it seems to me, uh, based on his wartime experience, uh, the sensitivity of buffer zones and things like that, which uh, Americans really don't like to take into account in foreign policy, but which, uh, which are reality. How far he would have pushed NATO east is something I'm very skeptical about. Uh, however, he would have uh, adhered to NATO. I saw that uh, on the 62 trip. This is one of my indelible impressions of, of him. Uh, touring the NATO realm, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it's impossible for me to imagine that he ever would have ever entertained the idea of dissolving uh, the relationship, the bonds that we forged in World War II. 
I think that emotionally, uh, he felt as deeply uh, for the areas where he served overseas as he, as he felt about his own country and he loved his own country. Uh, and so I don't, I think that the idea of NATO as a community uh, would have been something that he would have uh, continued. I hope that's responsive. Uh, we have a very big issue out there right now. We're looking at this war in Ukraine and we're all stirred by the spectacle of Ukrainian resistance and the demonstrating as it has the reality of a Ukrainian nation, which I don't think uh, many of us uh, were expecting. Uh, and so that raises the whole question of NATO. And I think that one thing that has come out of this, for better or for worse, whether NATO is in a lot of places where it ought to be or what its future is, I think we've uh, rekindled uh, a sense of uh, community and an appreciation, at least, for the uh, kinds of things that we have in common and that uh, this alliance does protect. And I think it is very effectively uh, protecting those values in that territory right now. One of the things that has been impressive to me from the outset of the Ukrainian crisis is that the, the Rush, we have served notice on the Russians that uh, NATO territory cannot be touched. And uh, I'm not reading a whole lot of speculation that there's uh, any, any thought that the Russians uh, will do it. I think the threat of a confrontation over NATO territory is passed uh, by signaling our resolution. We are a community. And uh, every trip we make to Normandy, we're about to make a bunch more uh, in a couple of weeks. And we're going to be making five. Uh, every trip we take to Normandy, cements that. We are proud of our countries. We are Americans. They are French, et cetera, et cetera. But we have uh, very deep things in common. And these are things that we will never, never give up. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Jim Gallen. I hope that's correct. Uh, it says, I really enjoyed Eisenhower at war. Do you plan to write another volume covering his later career? I have it in a, kind of in a form of draft, yes. Um, and I think that the, um, my plan, here's the problem. The problem is it was all dictated and drafted uh, before I accepted my current appointment at University of Pennsylvania. Meaning suddenly I ran out of time, number one. Number two, this is pre-word processor. So I have these massive drafts. I suppose I could scan them, but uh, even that's not very helpful because uh, they are so uh, uh, massively edited and things like that. Uh, what I will do, God willing, over the next uh, year or two or three, is I will transcribe these drafts I have on the Eisenhower presidency, which I think have a great deal of promise, uh, with the idea that uh, I will edit and publish, perhaps, or that... Uh, uh, perhaps one of my children will co-publish co with me. I have every intention of filling in uh, the, the story uh, between victory in Europe and going home to glory. There's a big story there. And that story uh, is winning the peace, uh, which is what the Americans proceeded to do from 1945 onward. Uh, uh, we won the war in 1945 and we won the peace. Uh, and so this is an ambition. By the way, another thing that I have, which is in much better shape because it's actually uh, uh, electronic, uh, is a volume on the year 1968, uh, which I approached somewhat like the, the Eisenhower War. The Eisenhower War was inspired by a book that was on Nixon's shelf in Florida. And I don't know how many nights I stayed up reading the book by a fellow by the name of Thompson, and the name of the book was 1940. And the thesis of a book on 1940 is that something basic happens in a year like that, that this is a, this is a hinge, this is a, this is a moment that, uh, uh, where the world emerges from this year different from the world that enters it, uh, and so on. I approached 1944 that way. Uh, my idea was that uh, in 43, uh, we're one nation, we're one force. In 1945, we're a different one. And so <clears throat> what is this transition about? That is what 68 is. And so I've got that in a fairly advanced state. But the Eisenhower presidency is a great challenge. It sprawls uh, over many subjects. 
but I think the central theme is uh, pretty much, uh, it'd be familiar, it seems to me, if you're looking at other past American wars. What ensues after a major war is a period of reconstruction. And who better to carry that out than a Dwight Eisenhower uh, who uh, uh, has uh, the reputation and stature emerging from a war to be able to command some sort of bipartisan consensus uh, to put the country back together uh, in a way that it can resume uh, its various political contests uh, and its uh, way of life, which it does in the 1960s. So the, the quick answer is yes, I intend to do this. Whether I personally can do that uh, is uh, a question mark. Uh, one of the things that I must do uh, if I am to follow up on this, and I intend to, is to return to Abilene, and I'm looking forward to that, uh, in order to retrace my footsteps through a lot of research, which I'd sort of lost over the years, uh, through uh, bundling up packages, and uh, I think uh, things were thrown away and so forth. I've, I've lost the thread on a lot of uh, documentation. I know where it is. Uh, so I'll get out there and re-research uh, a manuscript that hopefully I'll have in hand. I send students to presidential libraries to do that all the time, so I should be able to do it myself. Okay. Um, in, because of time, I am going to skip some of these questions that aren't directly related to our subject. I do apologize, but um, we are getting a little late. Um, so huh. I'm going to go down to to Jim English, who says, um, let's see, given the theologic background of his parents, what personality traits do you suppose he had that created this opposition to the wishes of his elders? Certainly, Swede Hazlitt played a very important part in his desire for military service. Wonderful question. Um, there is seems to me a theme of, if not opposition, at least identity uh, that has something to do with this uh, military uh, thing. I, uh, Ida was tolerant, by the way, of his choice. Uh, when he announced he's going to West Point, she says, that is your choice. Uh, but this idea of uh, identity and independence, number one. And number two, uh, Swede is a very in interesting introduction there because Swede is a, uh, I don't know who, uh, you know, I'd never met Swede Hazlett. I've read the correspondence, which is a fantastic correspondence. Uh, and my sense of it is that um, uh, Ike was a kind of, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, kind of a big guy, little guy uh, kind of friendship. Uh, Ike is the sort of the athlete and Swede was sort of the, you know, the, uh, the mind uh, and that there is a sort of protectiveness uh, about that. So the combination, it seems to me, of independence uh, and responsibility or protectiveness is a theme that runs through all biographies of presidents. So years ago, uh, not so long ago, I got a call in my office from Bonnie Angelo, who was a journalist, then writing a book about first mothers. And she elicited something from me, which I thought no one uh, would ever ask. And she said, I'm just back from the Eisenhower boyhood home in Abilene. And I've been to the Nixon boyhood home uh, in Yorba Linda. And are you, were, you've seen both of them. Are you as struck as I am by the similarities? And I said, Bonnie, you're talking about, again, I, I mentioned the word epiphany uh, earlier, but uh, this is uh, one of the epiphanies of my life. And that is uh, going to the Nixon birthplace, which is now the Nixon Presidential Library, with uh, a friend of Nixon's who is going to be one of the uh, prime movers in the early days of the Nixon Foundation to acquire that property, save it from condemnation, and to develop it as the, as the historic site that it is now. And... I can remember walking into that house. It's right there in New Orleans, famously, uh, and being stunned by the similarity between that house and the one uh, in Abilene. Uh, same rooms, same bunk beds upstairs, same mother, same father, same 
room full of boys, uh, et cetera. Same, 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 same. And I said to her, I was always someone who thought that Eisenhower and Nixon are completely different people. Uh, hardly but associate the two consciously. And it was in that moment that I began to see similarities. And I began to ask myself about what, what, are, what, what is the crucible that forms leadership? If you look at presidents, you'd be amazed uh, at how that pattern sort of repeats itself. It's a pattern of uh, assuming a lot of responsibility at a young age and a very strong sense of identity. Uh, and one reason that you assume responsibility at a young age is that uh, the family dynamic requires it. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is somebody who had sort of an absentee father. His mother lived in the White House with him until she died in 1940. Jerry Truman had a sort of wayward father, as I understand it. His mother was a disciple of Christ. Uh, so you have the Ida type figure, the inspiration. You've got the uh, uh, Harry must have been very important to his mother. She certainly infused him with a lot of uh, idealism and probably assumed a very important role in that family. Dwight Eisenhower, somebody who was somebody I think that family relied on um, uh, to a large extent. Uh, his father was disappointed in many ways, David was. Uh, he's somebody who had gambled land uh, in a business uh, venture in the late uh, 1880s and or 1890, and uh, as a result, suffered the stigma of having been uh, having lost a farm, which is a big deal for Mennonites. And so that makes him a manual laborer uh, in a community full of farmers. And um, I would say that made him a very tough guy. Uh, and I think that that I think Dwight Eisenhower sort of uh, probably butted horns with him uh, uh, fairly often. Uh, by the same token, he's being inspired by his uh, very observant mother who won uh, Bible quotation contests all over Dickinson County and that kind of thing. You look at Kennedy, he appears to be an exception, but uh, his father was a uh, real taskmaster. His mother was a beautiful rose. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, his father was kind of an alcoholic. His mother's the disciple of Christ. You look at Nixon, his father is somebody like David Eisenhower, my namesake. Uh, job to job to job, sort of a frustrated guy. The mother, Hannah, is a devout uh, Quaker uh, who raises her boys in a very idealistic way. Gerald Ford had no father. Uh, his mother was uh, sort of in the same vein. Jimmy Carter, his father was sort of a a uh, bourbon politician uh, in the South. His mother is a Peace Corps volunteer. You have Ronald Reagan. His father is an alcoholic. His mother is a disciple of Christ. Uh, you have George Bush, an apparent exception, followed by Bill Clinton, no father, uh, mother. In other words, does somebody assume a lot of responsibility at an early age? And I think uh, if they're forced to do that, that can, that can wear people out, but it can also make very strong characters. And I think strong characters have a sense of... Uh, uh, making their own way, what they're what they're going to do. They don't wait for others to make up their mind for them. Uh, the Eisenhowers had a very practical problem in the early 1890s and in the 1900, and that was how to survive. Uh, the Eisenhower brothers entered into an agreement. Uh, they would put each other through college. They knew they would have to do that. Uh, the fact that they had lost their their land uh, really cast them out uh, into a national system. They were going to have to make uh, make their way in the world the way most people do, which is by uh, becoming professionals. Uh, it's altogether different from uh, running a farm. Uh, and so they embark on this program, which has nothing to do with David Eisner and Ida, as far as I can see, and that is uh, establishing a conveyor belt you know, where one would finance the other through college, uh, and so on and so on. And they would go to the far corners of uh, America and make a mark. And they did. That's an extraordinary group of achievers. Uh, the Eisenhower boys uh, in Abilene, late uh, 1890s, extraordinary group. But by the same token, people who never lost a sense of where they were from, I'm certain that my grandfather became a farmer after he left the presidency because uh, uh, in, a, in a manner of uh, redeeming something that his father had lost. I have no doubt about that. Uh, and I think that that was his way of uh, 
reminding himself or affirming or living something that he felt was uh, sort of uh, the right way to live, that is uh, uh, tilling the land. Uh, and so as professional as he became, as cosmopolitan as he became, uh, he always had this idea that he would return to that. Um, so responsibility, uh, very important influence on the part of the mother. Uh, that's been characteristic of our presidents, by the way. Uh, I would say pretty much on down the line, Obama, uh, in search of my father, his mother is social worker, so forth. It goes on and on. Um, the big looming question is what's, what's going to be the pattern uh, for our first female president. We're going to have a female president here pretty soon. And uh, uh, how is that dynamic uh, going to change? I would say the pattern of early responsibility and idealism is so pronounced in presidents that I would say that it's uh, uh, a pattern. And Dwight Eisenhower was certainly part of that. But he was a great deal more, but we don't know a lot about him. Uh, so, so we're left to guess about uh, much in his background. All I can say is that what came out of Abilene in the form of him and, and others was uh, something very extraordinary. Uh, the monument in Washington, the Eisenhower Monument in Washington, I think captures a portion of that. Uh, there's actually a miniature statue, a smaller statue, which resembles the one in Abilene of Dwight Eisenhower as a young boy, uh, which I think is testimony to how important uh, his roots were. And by the way, I was told by, at the height of the controversies uh, over this thing, I was at the uh, groundbreaking for the Eisenhower Memorial. And a former student of mine who's now a very prominent pollster uh, said, you know, I, I, I get emotional every time I, I look at the plans for this thing because this is going to be the only place in all of Washington where a young, young boy can look into the eyes of a statue and say, that's me. Uh, and uh, aspire uh, to the kinds of achievements that Dwight Eisenhower uh, accomplished uh, in his life. And I think that's the meaning of the Eisenhower Memorial, to be honest. I think it's uh, where he came from, uh, the heart of America and what the heart of America meant uh, to America in the late 20th century and hopefully still means for America today. All right, we're gonna ask one final question. I do apologize again to everyone whose question I can't get to, but we are a little short on time. So our final question will be, with the Great Temptations, which comes from great powers over many decades, how did Dwight D. Eisenhower remain grounded to prevent abusing his powers or abusing his discretion? Well, that question right there goes right to the heart, I think, of one of the key biographical insights about Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, and my quick answer is, consider this. I think that professionally, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was uh, uh, somebody who was recognized throughout the Army as a very capable officer. I say in 1940-41, there's actually a news story uh, uh, about the Louisiana maneuvers, I think in Time magazine or something like that, uh, which says uh, the news that uh, Eisenhower had been promoted to so forth was uh, greeted with uh, amen throughout the Army. So he had a great deal of uh, peer respect. But he was not known uh, until 1942. That's uh, He's turning 52 that year. He spends 52 years of his life developing. He becomes well-known at the age of 52. And from the age of 52 to 79, uh, 78 and a half, uh, in those 26 years, he leads one of the greatest lives of the 20th century. Prior to that, he's somebody who might have, but for World War II, retired to Kansas or retired to Argentina or someplace like that. He is somebody who by the time most people are fulfilling an ambition, uh, finds himself uh, uh, entering into extraordinary responsibility, uh, having gotten over a lot of the things that ambition drives you towards uh, to that age. So he's a person of extraordinary balance. Uh, and wisdom uh, in his writings. That's one of the things that I would really recommend to people in the Abilene area. You've got a terrific facility there, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library, and these are records that belong to the public. Uh, I would recommend 
uh, going in there and examining uh, collections and taking advantage of that resource, believe me, hours in primary documents in a presidential library uh, are as meaningful as hours with your favorite book. Uh, but when you read the Eisenhower correspondence, you see an extraordinary maturity. Uh, and I would say that would have been different. I venture to say that would have been different if he had been born, say, the way a Herbert Walker uh, Bush was born or a John Kennedy born, uh, so forth, uh, somebody who was born into an environment where uh, your, uh, you have a, a very early sense of yourself as something very important. Uh, I think that Eisenhower probably esteemed himself. This is uh, not a psychology class. He would have had uh, a, a sense of himself, but he was not born important. And so he did not spend his maturity or his maturing years uh, nourishing a reputation uh, or defending a reputation. Uh, he was not somebody who... Uh, had so much to lose. Uh, by the way, that distinguishes him from, say, Patton and MacArthur. Uh, Patton and MacArthur both, in World War I, developed uh, great reputations as uh, dashing, valiant soldiers. And I think to a degree, uh, when you gain that kind of celebrity and notoriety, I think that your, uh, your curiosity and your growth to some, some degree is stunted. It stops. In other words, once you've succeeded, why, why be something else? And so I think that they're, they become sort of frozen in time. MacArthur becomes kind of a caricature of himself as commander of the Rainbow Division. Patton becomes this soldier who's leading tanks into battle uh, and so forth, all of which embody qualities, both of which embody qualities that are absolutely essential out of World War II, but causes them to be observed and known for better or for worse uh, as sort of uh, larger than life figures. Uh, I think they come to see, I think there's a certain corruption in that. I think they come to see themselves as sort of untouchable, uh, destined. I think that that got both of them in trouble. So I would say, uh, leaving aside all of the things that a behavioralist would say about a Dwight Eisenhower uh, based on earlier writings, and I do see a consistency of character, but that's the point. He, he's really the same guy in 1953 and 54 in his papers as he is uh, in the 30s when he's writing a, a diary working for MacArthur or uh, uh, his jottings in the 1920s. I think there's a Gruber diary, which is uh, uh, something that, that captures him. There are some snapshots of him earlier, and I think he's the same guy. And I think he was allowed to be the same guy. And then suddenly this great responsibility bursts on, upon him. And make no doubt about it, uh, he's somebody who felt equal to the moment. He'd been preparing for it, but he had not been preparing for it in a way that uh, he is going to abuse power. I think that he viewed both of his great responsibilities, uh, general and president, as sort of trusteeships. That's what my father said to me once, uh, reflecting on his father's presence. He says, uh, all right, so he's a trustee. What's wrong with that? Uh, in other words, why, we ought to have a, somebody who approaches the office that way from time to time. We really should. Uh, one of the life's lessons that I was raised with, raised with, was the idea that everything we enjoyed as kids was transitory, everything. Uh, we went from duty station to duty station in the Army. And this is what we were taught about the White, uh, the White House and other things that we came into contact with. We saw fabulous things as a kid. Uh, when we were kids, uh, Mary would back me up on this. Uh, and um, we were constantly brought back to earth by grandparents and parents who understood uh, this was uh, this was a transitory thing that uh, uh, this was a byproduct of duty. Uh, and that, that that was what was important. I think that's, uh, and the only thing I can say about that is he was allowed to be himself uh, for an extended period of time. And so when it mattered, he was himself and uh, the rest is history. 
right. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Wrap Everybody. this up. Thank right. you so much, um, David for your presentation. It was very informative. I do also want to say thank you to the other um, Eisenhower family members who have joined us. Welcome. Good. Thank you for tuning in. Um, before we sign off, we do have a few announcements. Um, Don, do you have anything you want to add before? Okay. So we're going to just make our uh, closing announcements and then we will say good night. So... Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm honored uh, to be included in your series, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting there to uh, uh, expedite uh, what one of the questions raised, and that is, uh, when are we going to when are we going to finalize or uh, turn into manuscript this uh, pre these presidential years, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I have to make an extended trip uh, to Abilene in order to get that off the ground. So I'll be seeing you guys uh, pretty soon. I'm looking forward to playing the course and uh, and uh, seeing my sister and uh, enjoying the town. So see you soon. All right, thank you. Um, if you. If you enjoyed this talk, you will certainly enjoy our Lunch and Learn for this month where we will welcome Mr. Alan Packwood from the Churchill Archives Center. Um, and he will talk about the relationship between Churchill and Eisenhower, mostly focused on Churchill, but um, of course, highlighting that that relationship and that will be Thursday, April 28th at noon central time. And then if you would like join us next month for Ike's Book Club, where we will welcome Dr. Al Ortolani with Humanities Kansas to talk about Great Eminence, which uh, Fox Connor in the Art of Mentorship. Um, if you haven't read the book, please join us anyway, uh, but you can get the book in our, in our, our gift shop. Um, and also at local libraries. And by the way, <clears throat> give my greetings to Alan Packwood. Uh, he and I are part of the same cruise program. We're probably going to be replacing each other uh, aboard a French uh, cruise liner in about four weeks. Uh, and he takes a lot of my students over at the uh, Churchill Project in Cambridge. He's a great man. And uh, I would highly commend uh, his uh, presentation to everyone. He's the living authority on Churchill right now and a terrific guy. So my best to him, if you would. I will. And then last but not least on um, Thursday, sorry, this isn't correct. That date isn't correct, but we will have Eisenhower, Dr. Jack Hall present Eisenhower Pandemic on an up to upcoming program. Uh, so please join us for those. And then we do want to thank our sponsors, the Jeff Cope Foundation and the Eisenhower Foundation, um, of which uh, these programs would not be possible. So again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful evening. <music>